Welcome to the Made for Agriculture podcast with Adam, Cameron, and Emily. Today's hosts are Adam Jones and Cameron Horan. All right, folks, welcome to another episode of the Made for Agriculture podcast. My name is Adam Jones. And I'm Cameron Horan. And we're back today a little early, uh, a little early in the season in 2024. Uh, we wanted to get into some of our uh, in-season agronomy episodes for 2024. Um, we had those on the calendar, and we decided to jump the gun a little bit and jump on here and record a podcast um, essentially geared towards wheat, uh, winter wheat in 2024. We've uh, had some pretty quick progression with with weather events for this year so far, um, have seen some disease issues in the field, and so we figured we'd jump on and, and try to get a timely episode out. So, um, Shannon, there's more more wheat down in your country and uh, so I'm going to let you kind of kick things off this morning and uh, kind of give an update. Yeah, thanks, Adam. So this year, um, wheat has progressed quicker than what we're normally expected. Um, we've had a we've had a drier, kind of warmer winter and fall, and with that, um, the wheat kind of broke dormancy sooner, and we're already starting to see flag leaves starting to poke out on some of the the earlier planted wheat now even some of the stuff that was planted you know kind of what we kind of consider ideal time um typically we're not thinking about you know flag leaf fungicide applications until that third or fourth week into april so we're definitely we're definitely ahead of schedule um so that's something that's something the team and i have been keeping an eye on um down here is kind of where we're at and then what's disease pressure looking like to the south um, one of our driver diseases for this area is stripe rust. Um, stripe rust doesn't typically, it doesn't overwinter here. Um, it overwinters south on, on living plants, and then it has to blow in um, either through storms and wind um, to infect our fields. So similar to Southern rust and corn, there's some trackers, follow people on social media, um, try to get an idea of what disease pressure is to the south. And that's one thing we've been looking at, and that's kind of kind of caught my attention a little bit sooner than than what we'd normally expect. Um, so I, there's a few certified crop advisors that I follow on, on Twitter and they, this week they've been reporting, um, stripe rust in Mississippi, central Arkansas and central Oklahoma. So with, with that in mind and kind of where our wheat's at, it's kind of got us maybe, maybe a little bit geared up to be ready to go with, you know, flag leaf fungicide applications <laughs> as early as next week on some of this, on some of this early wheat. Um, for those that don't know stripe rust um it's a it's it can be potentially a, a huge yield robber um it, it when it lands on the plant you know it infects the it infects leaves and particularly that flag leaf that leaf right below it um and th that's really our powerhouse that that drives that drives yield um typically the flag leaf and the leaf just below it account for roughly 80 85 percent of total yield so anytime we get you know disease pressure or lesions on the on that leaf um, we're definitely have potential to hurt ourselves um, in the long run. Um, I don't know if you guys have anything to chime in, go ahead and feel free. But, you know, stripe rust, it thrives in 50, 65 degree weather, moist conditions. Um, so look at the seven day, seven, 10 day forecast. We're, we're right there. Um, our nighttime temperatures are getting cool. We're getting up in the 60s during the day, but there's a lot of potential there for that disease to really blow up. Um, as much as a heavy dew that sticks around for most of the day is enough is enough moisture to really get this disease going. Um, and then, of course, variety resistance. That's that's what's going to be our driver. That's what's going to be the key of whether or not we have uh, an epidemic or not. From what I've seen in the past, um, especially on our soft wheats, those really high yielders, those those varieties are bred for yield and oftentimes the disease package kind of gets left in the, in the on the backside, uh, especially around stripe rust. So with that in mind, we always keep that in mind um, when we're planning for high yields. And typically, you know, we we need to make sure we're putting on that flag leaf fungicide applications to protect that flag leaf. The the last couple of years in my part of the world, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but my part of the world last two years, we haven't had really much disease pressure up to this point. It's been drier. Um, there hasn't been much pressure to the south. And we've kind of gotten by without having to worry about that flag leaf application. So it's really something We've kind of you've been fortunate enough, I guess. So we've been just looking at a head scab application um, with some products on the market that allow us to go a little bit earlier than what we've historically been able to do. Um, so that's I guess that's one reason why I'm concerned is because we've kind of gotten used to maybe just doing one application and not having to do the second. There's some concerns um, with you know 
with doing two applications, and that's primarily around what actives we're using. Uh, propiconazole uh, being our main one, you can only apply it twice in a year. There's only so much active you can put on in a year. Um, so if we're running a green app application, we have to be kind of cognizant of what we're what we're running on FlagWave. So there are, we may be limiting ourselves if we are running a green app application. Um, Scott, do you have anything you want to add on there? Not, no, you covered it. I mean, just basically, if you've ran if you've ran something with a propiconazole as a green up, and you're planning to come back with Miravisase which also has it in there, you need to do something different if you, if you are you put in a position where you need to, to spray the flag leaf. So that's going to that's gonna be your tilts, your quilts. You know, there's a number of generics, Trivapro. Um, you know, they're all going to have it, and those are things that may have been used at Green Up. Yeah. So I I guess from, from my perspective, from management practice, I kind of would li like us to get ready to be able to fly on or – apply um, ground rig it looks like it might be wet next week so maybe something we have to fly on um, ideally I like to use something um, with the strobe in it give us that that long-term protection just because we don't see the disease doesn't mean it's not there um, it blows in and it's going to start out initially as a, as a lesion on the leaf you'll start seeing some some lesions pop up and then your pustules will show up and like any disease any rust disease once we see those pustules we're actually in the the reproductive stage of that disease cycle and it's it's at that point it's then spreading more and more in the area so if we get a strobe if we're not seeing the disease we get that strobe out there that helps us keep us greener longer but we also want to have a triazole or group three to if there is any disease there currently it kind of stops it in its in its tracks um we're not going to cure there's some there's always some curves you know, there's always some terms you know like curatives we're not going to cure any tissue that's been damaged, but we can stop it from progressing farther and potentially cause it more harm. Diana and I had I had a question for you, if, if you all don't mind. Um, yeah, I think you've had more experience with this than probably any of us. Um, I guess the one thing just for anybody watching or listening, th this is different than I always want to say common rust, but in weed, it, leaf rust. Um, which I think a lot of us have probably had some experience with too. It's uh, it's not near as uh, detrimental detrimental to the crop as uh, stripe rust can be. Um, it's kind of di the difference between common rust and corn and southern rust. Um, but I have seen diff different weather conditions that drive it. I've I've seen common rust literally explode over a two day period where you were barely finding anything in the field on your hands and knees to where you could drive by the field and see it. Um, hot, you know, really got hot. I think there was humidity involved and everything. How quick have you seen striped rust blow up, if you will? Or Yeah, good question, Scott. So I'm going to say it was either 2015 or 2016. Um, we talked about those susceptible varieties. I've I've seen it where... It comes in, you see it one day, and you go back to the field the next day, and it's just completely everywhere. Okay. But in that scenario, in that scenario, we went back, we looked at the variety. It was a very poor rating for stripe rust, and so it was very susceptible. We had ideal conditions, and it just it just blew up. Um, when we think about the you know the environment that it needs to be in, if we have some thick wheat, some tall, dense wheat that's just hanging on to moisture all day long, that's that's when we start worrying about. You know, even if we don't have the rain, but we have the, the moisture in the canopy, that's where that disease can really thrive, especially if it's shaded in there and it's cooler there than it is on the, on, on the surface of the top of the plant. Um, it can really take off. Yeah, and I think that's the weather conditions that we seemed to have this year, Shannon. You know, like we we blew out early and looked like we were going to put a wheat crop on in, uh, in in April instead of instead of May and June. But um, now we've kind of backed off. And so we've got wheat that's very progressed from a growth stage standpoint because we blew out so early um and like you said you know I, there's frost outside my window this morning i mean it's uh we've cooled back down to the point where yeah those 50s and 60s and those ideal conditions are are there when the plant's really tall you know so it's going to hold on to moisture that way yep well then you mentioned another point there with you know the frost as as the wheat progresses as that wheat head moves up we are also um, being more cautious on what freeze potential looks like and what kind of damage freezes can cause on the heads. Um, we've had some, we have some pockets that we're already starting to see some some heads that have been affected by the freeze last week. So I think this morning it was 28 or 29 here. 
we're looking at 30 tomorrow night. I mean, if this continues for another couple of weeks, we might be looking at even more potential damage. So that's another thing to be thinking about when we're when we're looking at what the future holds for this wheat crop. Yeah, it's one, of the, point. one of the things I was going to mention, we Scott, it, Scott and Shannon, you guys kind of touched on it. Anybody can. Um, what is what are some of the defining characteristics between stripe rust and common rust or leaf rust for those guys that may not have seen it before, um, just when they're out in the field looking? Well, I guess one the the big big giveaway is just the where, you know where it shows up and within the pattern. So it's, as it has the name stripe rust, it, it makes these strips up and down the leaves. Um, you've got there's also uh, you know the regular leaf rust doesn't have that stripe or that strip, whatever you want to call it. And then there's a stem rust too that's primarily on the leaf sheaths and the stems. But this the just the they they did a good job naming it. Color too. Um, stripe rust tends to be a little bit more orange, bright orange. Uh, your common, your more your stem rust or your leaf rust, they're going to be more red, reddish in color, dark red in color. Uh, that's another way to to uh, identify it. I, I guess we ought to mention temperatures too. The stripe rust does. Um, develop at cooler temperatures than the leaf rust and stem rust so it'll be warmer conditions when those other ones show up i'm looking at the 10 day and sorry i was say i was looking at the 10 day in columbia and for lows just kind of going to what shannon was talking about with with injury yep um got one of 41 degrees but everything else is kind of staying above there so hopefully we're that's what i've really been concerned about a lot of times yeah. these cold snaps we get you know happen on the 8th 9th 10th of, of april um in a normal year that's just when we're beginning to joint um we have been caught during that time frame before but uh as as far along as we are this year um like i say it's been a real concern if you you know when you move we're talking about about jointed wheat and we worry i believe it's around 24 de degrees for a couple hours um double check myself here you get to uh you get to wheat that's in the boot and all of a sudden that's you know that's just 28 and you know when you're heading it's 30. so um you know we've if that 10-day ho forecast holds true and of course it can change a lot with topography and all that kind of stuff um but if it holds true we'll hopefully have dodged a bullet there yeah, most of the forecasts I've seen have, have looked like, you know, once you push through that 10 day outlook, maybe I don't want to say we're completely over the hump, but it does look warmer. And I don't see any of these kind of cold incursions coming in, but but they certainly could still. So we've had a now, few the one the last, last week weeks. is uh, I think it was the 27th. I mean, we, we got down in the low, low, you know, around 20 and kind of the oh, western yeah. side of of the central region and. Like Shannon said, we found, I looked at some weed out that way yesterday and found, found some minor damage on, on a few heads, uh, found, saw several flag leaves that were, that were starting to poke out that were, that were brown, um, which concerned me. Um, interestingly enough, on those same plants though, when you dug the head out, it looked fine. Um, so it's, it's going to be, be spotty, um. The variety thing, I guess, just to also echo what Shannon said, this would be a good time to to look at the uh, the variety you have going back to stripe for us. Um, in Central, this is generally, and Kevin, I won't speak for your area, but I spent a lot of time in Northeast Missouri too, and, and I, I guess I've got to include it as well. This hasn't been a major mover for us. We could we could find it. Um, there were certain varieties that that guys liked that Shannon said were yielders. But those particular varieties could really have an issue in a bad year. Um, but even that, I'm I'm taking off of guys quite a bit older than me, telling me things that that they'd seen in the past because it's just I just can't remember it ever blowing up and being an issue for us. Um, I didn't want to speak for the west side of the state where I hadn't spent near as much time, but I did talk to several guys over there yesterday, and and they kind of echoed that thought. But the big thing this year. You know, when you look at those plots down at OSU, the guys that are, you know, are, are at uh, Stillwater, 
Oklahoma, the guys that are looking at those, they're saying that they have never seen it this severe and this early since the early 2000s. Um, so having the wheat at the stage that it's at and then having that much disease already building up, you know, you're just essentially a, you know, a storm event or a windy day or whatever away from having a lot of it in our area. And that, that is a unique situation and why it needs to be on our radar, even though it's not generally been an issue for us. Jointed wheat on the 20th of March has generally not been an issue for us either. Yeah. That's and, we, right. and we had that this year. Yep. Absolutely. Guys, you got any other wheat topics you want to discuss? If not, I'll kind of pitch what our schedule is going to be for recording the rest of the uh, end season podcast this year. I just a couple things I'm thinking about here on fungicide applications. You know, if guys are going to go out and make that application, um, common question is, should I include insecticide in that in that application or not? Typically, I mean, I think we've been seeing a few aphids here and there. Typically, this time of year, aphid levels need to be pretty high um, to cause any harm going forward. There hasn't really been any other huge insect problems. Um, so my 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 word of advice would be only if needed. And if you are throwing an insecticide in, make sure it's something that's not oil based. Um, we get oil. We add oil to that fungicide. We have potential to burn in that flag leaf and we don't want to do any of that. Um, same thing with nitrogen. We don't want to be running a lot of nitrogen right now. Um, I, I know this weed has progressed maybe a little bit faster than what others, what some people were expecting. Um, and with that, you know, if you haven't had that second pass of nitrogen on yet, or you're you're holding out because you're waiting, you know, more for a normal year, we have potential now to burn a flag leaf that that is essentially the same as you know we get infected with a bunch of disease. So we might be cautious of that one as, as we're starting to make some of those management decisions moving forward. Um, and then looking ahead, this this application doesn't do anything for us for you know potential head scab outbreak. So we still have to be scouting. We still have to be watching for. Um, fusarium head blight and our conditions then when the head starts emerging and we start flowering of whether or not that that application is going to be need to be made or not um they're kind of two separate applications with two separate reasons behind them um so we just have to make sure we continue to be vigilant on our scouting and going forward okay sounds good thanks shannon for all the info thanks guys for the time this morning kind of discussing some timely week topics uh we are going to be back to our, our normal uh every recording every two weeks uh we will start that next friday um probably obviously be more uh corn and bean focused as we get folks getting ready to put stuff in the ground um we'll, we'll try to have some timely topics there too so we'll start recording those uh next friday so look for an episode then um other than that it, we will try to get this one out as soon as we can so thanks again for your all's time this morning and thanks to everybody for listening Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.